The Columbus Metropolitan Club was founded in 1976 by 13 women leaders who wanted to be included in the community conversation. I am Sally Bloomfield and I was one of those 13 women. Having been left out of men's clubs that focused on community issues, it was a priority for us to make the club 100% inclusive. Today, CMC presents public policy forums every Wednesday at lunch with average attendance of more than 200 people. I'm Tony Bell and I frequently attend forums which are open to everyone and present relevant, current and newsworthy topics. I'm grateful that CMC is nonpartisan and presents many perspectives on every topic. I'm Jane Scott, President and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. CMC is open to everyone. We invite you to explore the personal and professional benefits awaiting you at the Metropolitan Club. Welcome to CMC. 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 Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Niel Juris, the Director of Communications and Engagement at the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, also known as MORPSI. And I'm also a member of the Columbus Metropolitan Club's Board of Trustees. It's my pleasure to welcome our in-person audience today and to say hello to all of you watching via our live stream. Thank you to today's forum sponsors, Cardinal Health, and with the support of the Columbus Dispatch. Today's CMC live streaming is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. Thank you to you all. So, what began as an interpretive framework for scholars has exploded on the national education scene as the newest front in America's ongoing culture war. Critical race theory, which sought to better understand the role of race in the creation of legal, economic, and social systems, is to some a way to spotlight the inequities in our society, while to others it's, an application, its application threatens to further divide Americans from each other. But what is critical race theory? Who is using it, how, and to what end? Should critical race theory play a role in the classroom curricula? Today, our expert panel will discuss the past, present, and future of critical race theory in America. I'll introduce the panelists by name and position, and you can find out more about who they are from your forum flyer and online. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Adair, President of the Columbus Board of Education, Aaron Baer, President for Center for Christian Virtue, Kevin Magruder, Associate Professor of History at Antioch College, and our host, Alyssa Woodman Neese, Columbus Dispatch's K through 12 education reporter. But be, oh, go ahead. <laughs> but before we turn the program over to Alyssa, Kevin Magruder will provide us with a brief overview of the history of critical race theory and why it has become the center of controversy in recent months. Kevin, the podium is all yours. I appreciate uh, this invitation to participate in this discussion of critical race theory. Critical race theory is a framework developed in the 1970s and 1980s by legal scholars such as Derrick Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Delgado, and others in response to what they saw as a loss of momentum of the civil rights victories of the 1960s. In considering the reasons for this retrenchment, they concluded that while many view the law as a neutral institution, in U.S. history, the law has been a primary vehicle for maintaining the racial hierarchy of our society, with people of color at the bottom and white people at the top, a hierarchy that the civil rights movement sought to overcome. Critical race theorists concluded that eradication of racism in our society required a recognition of this institutional history and the influence of this legacy on contemporary laws and policies. With this recognition, 
a plan to dismantle the barriers to equity that such practices represent could be developed. An example of critical race theory perspective comes from my own primary area of research, the history of race and real estate. To understand the intractability of residential segregation in the United States, we have to acknowledge the role of the law that enforced racially restrictive deed covenants until the Supreme Court's 1947 Shelley versus Kramer ruling outlawed such enforcement. But this decision did not undo the residential segregation that the covenants inspired. Segregated neighborhoods continue to exist in many parts of the country today. More intentional contemporary action is required. Critical race theory is not a diversity or anti-racism training, although some of its perspectives may be incorporated into these trainings. Its purpose is not to make white people feel guilty or ashamed. Its purpose is to provide an analysis that can inspire the dismantling of laws and other practices that promote racism. Critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 schools and is not often mentioned in undergraduate college classes. It is a framework that is more commonly encountered at the graduate school level. The reason there is a need today to explain what critical race theory is not is because for over a year, it has been used as a tool in an extremely successful disinformation campaign launched in 2020 by conservative activist Christopher Rufo to silence advocates of anti-racism. A June 18, 2021 New Yorker Magazine article noted that in 2020, Rufo received information about what seemed to have been poorly designed anti-racism trainings that targeted white participants. Rufo concluded in articles that he wrote in City Journal, an online magazine of the Manhattan Institute, that framing these trainings and almost every other action associated with anti-racism as critical race theory in action would be an excellent way to end the trainings and to mobilize support to challenge anti-racism advocacy, which was gaining momentum. Donald Trump's September 2020 executive order outlawing critical race theories use in federally funded trainings soon followed. In December of 2020, the American Legal Exchange Council, ALEC, held a training, which can be viewed on YouTube, for state legislators to learn how to draft anti-critical race theory legislation, with a particular focus on public education at the K through 12 and college level. In Ohio, two bills, HB 322 and HB 327, are the result of this campaign. The 2014 homicide of black teenager Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, led to the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and to the growth of discussions of the concept of anti-racism. Anti-racism is a framework that intersects with critical race theory, but is broader. It concludes that in an environment in which racism is perpetuated by laws, policies, and institutional practices, individually, not being racism is not enough to end racism. Instead, action is required to identify and dismantle policies and institutional practices that maintain a racial hierarchy. The disinformation campaign fueled by Christopher Rufo is part of a historical tradition in the United States of backlashes to the possibility of achieving racial equity. As a nation, on paper, we are a multiracial democracy. But in practice, we are a nation in which some white citizens expect to always have a dominant voice. And where the possibility of sharing power with citizens of color is seen as a threat or a loss of their power and privilege. A brief historical review. In the 1820s, when most states rewrote their constitutions to eliminate property qualifications for voting, all white men gained the vote. But many of those same states introduced, for the first time, voting restrictions for black men. In the 1870s, during the Reconstruction period that followed the Civil War, black men gained the vote. And the result was the election of two black men to the US Senate, 16 to the House of Representatives, and hundreds to state and local offices. This fueled a backlash of racial violence that ended black voting in the South and ushered in 80 years of racial segregation and violence. The civil rights victories of the 1950s and 60s 
were followed by the migration of many white Southern Democrats to the Republican Party, which in the 1968 presidential campaign, Richard Nixon branded as the party of law and order. Barack Obama's 2008 election was followed by a rise in white nationalism and the environment that leads us to today's topic. When we view the current debate over critical race theory in this context, we can better understand that the debate isn't about critical race theory, but instead about a much larger issue, an age-old fear of sharing power and privilege. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that introduction. It was really informative and helpful. And um, I think really that's the goal for the panel today. Um, I understand that critical race theory was a topic that many club members expressed interest in discussing. And while it might be a hotly debated topic right now, I think we can all model how to have a really informative, helpful, and respectful conversation, and hopefully learn a little bit more about each other's opinions and perspectives. So I'd like to start with a question for our other two panelists, uh, Jennifer and Aaron. Um, when did critical race theory surface as a topic that was being discussed among your organizations and your stakeholders? And um, what were you hearing from them? Um, thank you for that question, Alyssa. <clears throat> um, as uh, the school board, we, um, you know, obviously we are watching what's happening closely in the legislature. And so, um, you know, we were watching on a national stage what was going on and just the conversation and what was happening in other states where these bills uh, that the professor was talking about were introduced, especially around that K-12 space. And so, um, you know, we saw uh, after our legislature introduced those two bills is when, as an organization, um, we started to, to really watch it and, and, and speak on it. And our board actually, uh, you know, issued a, is a, a resolution um, against those two, uh, those two bills. So that's when it became uh, part of our kind of... Uh, monitoring. Now, what's been going on across the county, across the state, in other districts um, is y you've all seen it uh, in the media. Some of you may have experienced it yourselves um, where, uh, uh, you know, people are coming to school boards and saying, you know, don't teach critical race theory to our kids. Um, and it's becoming a topic that is now in the forefront of what's going on at the local level uh, in board, school board governance. Um, in our district, we, are, we don't have that right now, um, but we have taken a very strong stance um, against those two bills as well as issued um, basically uh, an anti-racism resolution at the beginning of the pandemic uh, after the George Floyd um, issue. So we take these issues very seriously. Um, equity is one of our driving principles, um, really rooting out the inequities that are going on in our district to provide fair opportunity. So critical race theory in that context has come up more at a gover governance level, um, watching it um, as the leaders of the organization uh, monitoring uh, how it's going to impact our students and classrooms. Yeah, I'd say for us, uh, we saw, you know, CRT to, to uh, Kevin's uh, introduction was something I had heard about in college years ago, very briefly didn't remember much about it, but then the issue itself started rising up in a, a number of probably two, really three different areas uh, right after the, the George Floyd murder. Um, and it was something that was popping up. I think the first place we saw it come up was uh, in churches. So as churches were trying to talk about uh, racism uh, and the, the issues of race in, in our country today, uh, you know, they, I, one pastor told me he found himself sort of caught between these two uh, ideologies. There was the one side that was saying, you know, any talk of race uh, is, you know, is wokeness and you can't, you know, if, if you're mentioning issues of racism or, or uh, these types of things today, uh, then, then you're, you're, you've gone so far left and you're, you're, you've gone woke. And then the other side, which is saying if you're not teaching, you know, uh, if you're teaching uh, CRT, you've gone Marxist. Uh, and, uh, and so pastors sort of feeling caught between these, hey, look, we want to talk about race. We don't affirm the, the principles of CRT, uh, but they sort of felt trapped in that spot. Uh, so that was something that we started seeing uh, come up more and more after, after George Floyd. Uh, the other place we saw this was in education. 
um, where uh, parents saw their children uh, really being pressured to uh, affirm tenets, uh, especially of the organization Black Lives Matter, um, and, and affirm that the, the movement there that they disagreed with, uh, and doing things like walkouts uh, and, and sort of going through uh, the, you know, some, some you know, shaming things around, you know, around your race or around uh, how you identify. Uh, and so we started seeing parents, more and more parents starting to say, hey, this is happening in our schools uh, across the state. Uh, and what do we do about that? Uh, and then the third, uh, is, which is very similar to what we saw happening uh, in the schools, is sort of that same uh, uh, ideology uh, that, again, we've called CRT, and I think there's an, uh, you know, Kevin raises an interesting point of, is it CRT? And I, I, would, I would argue generally yes, or it's influenced by CRT. Um, we started seeing that same thing happening in corporate America, uh, where uh, employees were being forced to uh, kind of go through uh, what they would say is a, a shame, what I would say is a shaming exercise uh, around uh, sort of things that they had nothing to do with. Um, and, uh, and so we, th that's where all, the, and again, it really was, it, for, from our perspective, the whole debate really popped up and, and started raging within the last 18 months to a year. Thank you for that. And um, Kevin, I, I wanted to turn it back to you now. Um, We've had several professors and school leaders go on the record in the dispatch, and um, you as well in your introduction saying that critical race theory as an academic concept isn't something that's typically taught at the K-12 level. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. Like, were you surprised to hear about these conversations bubbling up as it relates to K-12 education, and is what's happening critical race theory? No. <laughs> What's happening is not critical race theory. What's happening is people who are skilled in communication are, use, are using a technique known as the straw man. When you don't have a good argument for your opponent, you frame your opponent's argument as something ridiculous, and then you develop an argument around that ridiculous opposition that you've created. Um, I've been teaching at the college level for about 20 years. I have not taught critical race theory. Um, what I teach is in understanding history, if you don't understand the role that slavery and racism has played in our country and you graduate from college, you're going to be uninformed. And I'm not going to teach people who 10 years after they leave my class are uninformed. And that's what this is about. And part of the reasons why it's being structured that way is because they don't want to say they're against anti-racism. Because if they're against anti-racism, what does that make them? And so what they've done is manipulated what critical race theory is to serve their purposes. And I think if we kind of spend a lot of time drilling down on what critical race theory, it's a, it's a process, a system of evaluating the law is relatively narrow. And so nobody is teaching third graders that. You're not even teaching college freshmen that. And it's almost kind of like a charade that we're all kind of trapped in, I believe. Now. Aaron or Jennifer, do you have anything you'd like to say in response to that? Yeah, and I, I would just disagree with, I'm sorry, Jennifer, if you had, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I would just disagree with that on a, a few different uh, uh, different levels. One, on first and foremost, on the on the claim of straw man, I feel like a lot of times there's a straw man straw man built up against those who oppose uh, CRT, uh, and and that's that, you know, this idea that uh, those that oppose CRT don't want our nation's history taught, don't want the history of uh, racism, the you know the Trail of Tears, uh, you know, and, you know, I'm 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 Jewish uh, ethnically, and you know the 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 history of uh, of anti-Semitism and all that, we, we want to just get all that uh, history out, we want to blot it over and just say America was the greatest nation and no, nothing ever bad happened here. That, that couldn't be farther from the truth. And a lot of times when I ended up talking about this, that's the claim I'm, I'm having to, to respond to. No, we, we want that history taught, we want uh, that, that perspective taught. And I, I want to go back to something that, you know, Kevin mentioned in his introduction where he said, you know, this is, you know, it talks about uh, how CRT leads to the inspiring of the dismantling of laws and policies. And I think when you read some of the, the, the folks that are, are writing the most around C, uh, CRT today, Ibram X. Kendi, uh, Robin DiAngelo, they'll talk about how CRT is a, is a perspective 
on how knowledge, language, and power uh, are all you know, sort of corrupted uh, by this history of racism. And so it, it, it has this sort of conspiratorial mindset of everything that we interact with in society today is racist, and there's no getting around it. And it becomes almost this unfalsifiable argument, uh, and everything gets sort of funneled through this lens of race. And when you start there, that's where you see, absolutely I agree, that you're not seeing people, you know, hey boys and girls today, let's talk about critical race theory. That's not happening. I don't think anybody's arguing that that's happening. But what, what you are seeing is you're seeing the world interpreted, uh, everything from history to language to mathematics, uh, interpreted through a critical race theory lens, saying this is the true and accurate, accurate framework to understand the world, and if that's the true and accurate framework to understand the world, everything that we study needs to be perceived through this lens. So we have some people saying that critical race theory isn't being taught in schools. We have some people saying that it is, in, to a sense, being used to frame some of the discussions happening in schools. Um, regardless of what we're calling it, there are some changes happening in schools right now. And um, Jennifer, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what's happening at Columbus City Schools as it relates to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and um, things that maybe might be mislabeled as critical race theory. Yeah, thank you for that, Alyssa. I think that in the K-12 space, uh, we are totally misusing this label, critical race theory. Um, critical race theory, as has been explained to us, is a very narrow construct and something that is used uh, to really evaluate legal and systems. Um, what's happening in the K-12 space is a intentional shift uh, to really focus on teaching culturally responsive methods and techniques, really valuing and appreciating every student and their background as they come through the door, and our staff's backgrounds as they come through the door, and ensuring that as we're teaching the standards that have been set out for us, that our curriculum really supports individual learning growth and development of each child. It's really important that children can connect to the lessons that they are learning, that they can see themselves in the stories that are told to them, that they can appreciate the differences that come with their neighbors and their friends and their families because that's really what makes us stronger. It's important that our students can understand that feelings are okay and empathy is the key to how we are going to move forward as a society. This is what is being done in the K-12 space. We are ensuring that this is being done with professionals who are trained in a psychologically safe manner for all that are involved. What we're doing is talking about things at the appropriate level for each child in each grade band that touch on the standards that we are required to teach in the state of Ohio. By infusing content and stories that help our children learn better. That's what we are doing. Now, are some classes maybe higher up in uh, high school with some electives maybe touching on themes of racism or how, how race comes into play? Yeah, because this is part of our history, right, Aaron? Part of our history. We cannot shy away from this. Um, this is how we are, who we are, how we were created, and it's important each student is able to articulate these things as they leave our doors in the public education space. We are not at all teaching a CRT, and I just have to keep saying that because that is not the case. What we are doing is teaching uh, and shifting our methods to really focus on each child and giving them the things they need in order to succeed. I'm really focusing on this idea of cultural responsiveness. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so this is a question for whoever uh, wants to take a stab at it first, but um, should we be having these conversations about racism and its role in history with students? And if so, what is the right way to do that? How do you guide that kind of conversation and um, make sure it is age appropriate and make sure that students aren't leaving that space with negative feelings, for example? Um, like, yeah. The approach with good teaching is a cooperative exercise that 
I think some of the people who, who are behind these laws don't understand that. And so when they're talking about teachers creating divisive situations, if you have shamed your students, you're not, you've lost them. And so a good teacher is not doing that. And so when we are talking about race, the purpose is for a black or white child or Latino, Asian child growing up today, seeing racial disparities that exist today, often the explanation is because some people work harder than others. And if they don't understand the history behind that, they believe that. And some people do work harder than others, but it's not by race. But we have racial disparities, and the reason for that is the history of our country. And so that's what we're trying to describe. And no student should feel shamed by that. And that's not the intent of good teachers. I'm not saying it never happens, but like I said, if you shame the student, you've lost them. And, um, and so that's the approach. Um, these aren't obscure facts. They're readily available about the history of race in the country. And there are schools where children do not learn that. And they enter the world uninformed. I do have students in my classes say, why didn't I hear about this before? And I'm not teaching them any diabolical conspiracy or anything like that. I'm teaching them what well-informed students should know. And that's my goal as a teacher. You know, the only thing I would add, add to that, he used the phrase cooperative exercise, and I think a lot of what you're seeing today uh, in that cooperative exercise that, uh, that, especially when you're seeing in the education space uh, and what you're seeing at a lot of school boards, uh, is parents feeling left out of this equation, uh, parents feeling like uh, they're not being fully uh, brought into the, the conversation of what's happening, and they're, they're being, again, and this is the, the, the downstream effect of, of uh, you know, the, the framework of CRT being implemented in the classroom um, of, of children f feeling like, or parents feeling like their children are being taught something uh, through a lens uh, that uh, is harmful, that, you know, is racist in some uh, aspects. Um, I, I think about, again, this conversation is happening both in the church uh, along with the, uh, in education. Uh, there's a theologian, uh, a guy named uh, King's College professor named Anthony Bradley, someone I respect greatly. He actually is someone that's not opposed uh, to critical race theory. Um, and he wrote a, 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 an essay that uh, he said, you know, we sh with, with CRT, the church should be able to eat the meat and spit out the bones. Uh, that was his argument, that like, hey, there's some things in CRT that are helpful to the church to understanding uh, the, the context of race uh, in America, and there's some things that aren't, and we should just toss those things aside. And I appreciated that framework of it. However, I, what I disagreed with him on that is that the meat of CRT, the benefits of CRT, talking about the history of racism, talking about how that history, again, you, you don't have a, you know, in one generation ago, you had you know, a lot of the grandparents here, or, or our grandparents here, were individuals that uh, lived segregation. You don't abolish the effects of that in, in over, uh, only a few decades. Um, but the, the, the meat of CRT that we're able to, to get, we can get other places without everything else that comes along with it, with these power dynamics and, and seeing it in all things and, and sort of uh, group uh, and, and, sort of, and, and broad uh, guilt and shame that come along with CRT. Can I jump in here? I think that there's some kind of misunderstanding or misconception about K-12 curriculum in general, that somehow it's been labeled perfect already. And the truth is it's not. The truth is it is far from perfect. The truth is K-12 curriculum is taught differently in every state. You can pick up a textbook that is made by the same company that has different facts uh, different stories told um, depending on where you are. The Texas book is different than the Ohio book. Um, you know, I, I think there's a misconception. Um, the winners write the history. The winners write the story. And, and I think this is a move to center it. Um, to really highlight in, in those stories and context other stories, other people's stories in that shared history. 
Um, it isn't just the pilgrims came over and, you know, d you know the, the Indians were bad and they took over the Indi I mean, that's not, that can't be the shared story. Um, it can't be the shared story that we only learn about black history during February and we go from slavery to the civil rights movement. That cannot be the shared story because that is not our history. That is a story. It isn't a statement of fact. History are facts. And, and that's what we're trying to pull into when we talk about cultural responsiveness. And you know, I wonder why. Why is it that we can't, why is it that it is so bad to talk about? And another thing about feelings, I, I mentioned that earlier. Feelings are okay. We need to have feelings because all humans do. And the beautiful part of the K-12 space is that we help our children understand how to interpret their own feelings, have it come out in a safe way that is productive, right? We're so into that right now. Hello, social emotional learning, if anyone has heard about that. That's what that all is about. So why not be able to have these kind of conversations, um, you know, have these spaces that are safe in a manner that is appropriate for the child at each grade level and you know works in that setting. And when I talk about appropriateness for the child, I, I, I need you to understand, kindergartners are not learning about racism. Kindergartners are learning about themselves and their role in community. They're learning about their identities. They're learning about the people in their lives and their neighborhoods. They're learning how to read a map and like draw their neighborhood, right? Think about what you are, but in that context, in your neighborhood, in your society, you're already getting filters in. And then it builds as, this, as the child gets older and older. Those are the standards that the Ohio um, Department of Education has set forth, that every school, public school district in Ohio is doing. Um, and so these things are incremental, and these things are done in a way that builds children and should build them in a way to produce graduates that can go on to college and, and sit in a profession, professor's class and understand history and also be mentally and socially ready to have those conversations. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I, I just really appreciate the honest, passionate, open discussion. This has been really wonderful. Um, we're going to move to questions from our in-person and live stream audience in just a few minutes, but I wanted to ask you one final question before we do that. Um, I think we've had a really good discussion about the past and the present, but I wanna look to the future, and uh, might seem like a pretty broad question, but where do we go from here? What are the goals that you have for the education of students of, of all ages as it relates to this topic? And what, what are you thinking we're going to see in the upcoming school year when students return this month? Um, I mean, I'll start. Uh, in, my, in our school, we are gonna see no change. Uh, our, our, st our teachers are gonna do the thing they are uh, paid to do, the thing that they're doing very well. Uh, following um, all of the principles and standards, uh, creating all that I said, those psychologically safe spaces, working on building culturally competent curriculum. I think, though, in the education space in Ohio, we're in for a fight. And uh, you have a school board here in, in your uh, you know, capital city that is willing to fight. Um, and so that's what your elected officials will do. We're gonna leave the politics out of the classroom, let our teachers do their job, and the politicians are gonna handle it from here. I mean, for me, um, Antioch College is a private college, so we aren't directly affected by the laws that are dealing with public education. Uh, I'm gonna continue teaching the way I've been teaching. Um, personally, I am, very concerned, and the analogy that comes to mind for me is Salem, Massachusetts in 1692 to 1693, when for nine months over a dozen people were put to death as witches. And when you look at what allowed that to happen, it was a combination of manipulation of the law uh, justified by religious belief 
that allowed that to happen. It ended when the governor who had been out of the state came back and everybody was like, the scales fell off and what have we done? And I feel like we're in that moment, not just because of critical race theory, but who would have thought that we have a nation where facts don't matter? And we've been in that for half a decade. And how do we, how do we get out of it? So the fact is that critical race theory is something, but it's not what these people are saying it is. But we cannot get out of this loop we're in. And it's almost like we need the governor, some governor, to come back and set things right so we can see reality. And I'm, I'm 63 years old, so I'm not so optimistic that that's gonna happen in the direction that we're going. And so I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, think, um, I think a few things are where we go from here. Um, I think one, uh, and I, I can't thank uh, CMC enough for this, um, this kind of discussion uh, doesn't happen a lot where people with very different views uh, come together and very different perspectives. Um, I, I will say I think, um, you know, the, the, the people that uh, disagree with CRT, you know, people that I work with, folks that support us, the people we work with, um, I, I, you know, we talk about this all the time of how do we, how do we humanize the people we disagree with. Uh, and I think uh, for anything, uh, anything real, anything progressive to happen on this issue where we're actually coming to some resolution, uh, it, it's, it's not going to happen in the current uh, political climate we are in where we all just kind of go to our tribes and, and sit there and live in it. Um, I, the people that oppose CRT are, are not racist. They, they don't want, it's not that they don't want, uh, you know, the history of race and the, and the, the serious, uh, ugly history of our country taught. That's not true. Um, they have concerns about how it's being implemented, and I, and I think the more we can understand each other, the better it'll be. Uh, you know, I think uh, one of the things that we're going to see from this in the future, and this is something that uh, my organization is, is uh, advocating for, uh, and it's something that Jennifer and I would disagree on, uh, again, uh, very seriously, is, is more school choice. Um, we, uh, we're, we're big advocates of what's called the backpack bill, um, to give every child the option to access uh, a scholarship to attend uh, the, the public school of their, their choice. Uh, and I think you're seeing a lot of this debate uh, and a lot of other things in, in our, our world right now driving uh, that, that move towards more uh, educational opportunities for children and families. Um, and I think you're going to see more of these uh, uh, CRT laws, anti-CRT laws uh, being considered that's going to be debated this fall here in Ohio. Um, and, and so, you know, I, there, there's going to be a lot of things. That this, this debate is far from over. This, we can have this discussion two or three, you know, ten years from now. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll make some progress in the discussion. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. And Jane Scott of CMC is curating questions from the live stream audience and from our in-house audience. Um, please keep your questions brief and to the point. Uh, Jane, what's our first question? Well, I have some questions that were asked from people who registered, as well as I'm getting questions from people online. I'll do one, and then we'll every other one. So we'll have an opportunity for both. Uh, and we probably won't get to all the questions, so we appreciate that. This is from Carmen Casillas, Columbus Metropolitan Library. For those who are immediately opposed to a critical viewing of the past, how do you propose we bridge the gap? How can we invite those who see criticism as a thoughtful engagement with a difficult subject, but as in, not as thoughtful engagement with a difficult subject, but as inherently anti-American as a process? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. And that's what I mean about when a starting point is usually facts. But when, like COVID, there are facts, but we're living in the Delta variant. Voting, election results are facts, but they're being manipulated. And so when you're in that environment, this is something we have not experienced as a nation before, so I don't know. I, I'd say the, the starting point is charity, uh, is looking at somebody who disagrees with you uh, and not ascribing uh, terrible motives to them uh, and, and recognizing that uh, you know, they too w want the best for society. Uh, they, they, they're not looking to oppress any individual or any class. 
um, and they just come to their, their conclusions, their, their uh, endeavors to do this uh, a different way. You know, this is something we do a lot in the interfaith dialogue uh, with uh, Muslims or Jews or atheists or, or anybody else of, of starting off of, you know, we both want to see people flourish. Um, and the way we, you know, your perspective on how we do this is this religious belief we are, is through Jesus Christ uh, and him crucified. And so, uh, you know, I, I think starting off in that, that charitable mindset when having a discussion with someone uh, is the way, if this conversation is, is able to move forward, is the way it gets done. My name is Becky White. Um, I'm, I have read several articles in the Wall Street Journal over the last year, year and a half, that indicate that um, there's reason to be concerned about CRT being included in the curriculum. The NEA promoted, uh, promoted it. Um, the Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education promoted it. Um, the school, California passed legislation to include it in the school systems there, K through 12. So in light of that, and given the concerns that sometimes there might be overreach in training in CRT where there's shaming going on or uh, fingers being pointed at people who can't really do anything about it, why wouldn't the, um, the Ohio Board of Education support the Ohio bills to prevent that kind of thing from happening in the classroom? That kind of thing is not happening in the classroom. CRT is not part of the curriculum. It is not being taught. It is not a standard. That is not what is going on here in Ohio. Now, are there conversations? Uh, it does race come up in, in the context of history? Yes, it does, because it is part of our history. Um, I can't speak to what the State Board of Education does. Um, you know, I, I would strongly suggest they oppose these bills and fight for the education, a factual education that all of our students should have. Um, but it is not happening. It's not happening in Ohio. To chime in real quick, uh, in Ohio, there is no standardized state curriculum. Districts are left to decide how they teach specific state standards. So the idea of CRT being mandated at the state level would not happen. This question is from Michael Deacons from Capitol High School. What does the term white supremacy culture mean and how does it relate to critical race theory? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, if, if we were in Ohio in 1921, we might hear white supremacy being used pretty regularly because they were not ashamed of it. The Klan rose to power after Birth of a Nation in 1915. Indiana became their base. That's what's white, that, that's the most extreme example of white supremacy. But what su white supremacy is, is a belief that if white people aren't on the top in every situation, something is wrong. And efforts need to be made to make it right. And if we look at what's happened in the last few years, there are people who believe that. And we know it. <laughs> and they've done things, but we're pretending like it doesn't exist and it's something new. And it's not. Yeah, I, I think the one thing I would just add to that really, really briefly is um, white supremacy does exist, and there's absolutely people that still are advocating and pushing for that. I, I, you know, I think we might have a disagreement on the, the uh, proportionality of it, uh, and I think one of the things that, again, from a charitable mindset, the idea that you know, sometimes what's purported uh, by some folks is that you know, every person that voted for Donald Trump uh, is a white supremacist, and, and a white supremacist as defined uh, by Kevin. Um, and, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not saying you're saying that. By all, no, all means, Kevin, I'm, I'm, I'm not ascribing that to you but at all. But when you bring that into a conversation following up with me, that's what you're implying. No, and but, I did not do that. No, and, and, and by all means, Kevin, I'm, I am not ascribing that to you in the least. Why talk about it at all? Because <laughs> a lot of the folks that are advocate, you know, the Robin DiAngelo's of the world, the Ibram X. Kendi's of the world, a lot of the major voices in culture today advocating for CRT, the very discussion that we're having today, would suppose something like that. And when you turn on MSNBC, you turn on CNN, you hear that push. When you turn on Fox, you hear the other narrative push that everybody 
uh, that is pushing CRT, hates America and wants to destroy, it, it, it's all made to, to divide us and to go, have us go at each other's throats. I 100% I agree with what you just described there, Kevin, and I'm not ascribing this to you in the least. But what I'm saying, you know, in the cultural narrative we're having, the cultural conversation that's going on even outside of this room, all too often those are the things, it's the same thing I see oftentimes in the church where uh, people will think anybody that voted for Joe Biden wants to kill all babies uh, because he's not pro-life. And that's not true. Um, and, and we need to be able to, to not let ourselves get divided by over-the-top rhetoric. And that, that's the point I'm, I'm trying to make there. Um, my name is Dara Pizzuti, and I just want to say thank you to all of you. This is a tough subject. Um, my question is for Aaron. Uh, there's been quite a bit in the news lately with some of the schools, particularly some of the private schools here, who are wrestling with this um, challenge. And it's interesting because, I'll be honest, I have friends, dear friends, that I love and adore and respect on both sides of this issue. And I thought you made a very good point when you said we have to start by listening to one another. And I try very hard um, to listen to both sides. I, I find it interesting, though, that when I talk to my friends and peers who support your point of view more um, and want to keep CRT out of the schools, and I find myself saying to them, what is it about CRT that you find so offensive? And, and you know, what is the real problem here in your school? Because to me, it's, I mean, I'm in those schools and they're not teaching it. They don't often have the answer. They fall back on the rhetoric. And so I guess I'm asking you point blank, what is it that people find, that your constituents find so offensive about CRT that they're so afraid of? Yeah, you know, at its core, and again, this is where we have to have the, the conversation, and, and a lot of times CRT is used as a, a broad term, as, as Kevin alluded to earlier, that, you know, wraps in uh, anti-racism, wraps in uh, intersectionality, a, a lot of these other concepts, and it's all, a lot of times it, it, in a very inarticulate way, gets all bunched under CRT, uh, and folks will say, well, we're talking about CRT, the theory, not CRT, the application of it. And so what most folks are having a problem with is, what's being applied in schools uh, through the mindset of, you know, inspired by the mindset of CRT. Again, the, the, the way I would I'd describe CRT uh, is it's, you know, the theory of how language, power, and knowledge uh, have all been uh, corrupted and geared towards uh, a sort of a racist end. Um, and so what, what they have a problem with, most people what they have a problem with is that uh, the teaching that gets taught about race, the teaching that gets taught about American history, uh, and the way racism is taught, uh, is that I can know something about someone. I can know something about an individual and their character based on their race alone. And so if, what, if, if that's the mindset that people are, that, that is being taught, that I can know something about who you are, I can know something about your character based on your race, uh, and that's where you get this, this whole thing of like, hey, introduce yourself and, and, and say, you know, you, you saw this happening in some corporations, you saw this happening uh, with walkouts in school, that you need, you need to apologize for your race. And by apologizing, it's, you are inferring uh, that, some, that you have done something racist, you have done something of ill intent to people. Uh, and that would be, uh, again, the, the, the major concern that, that most parents and folks have about the way the, the implementation of this framework uh, is being used in schools today. There's no direct link between what you're describing and critical race theory. You're describing our ham-handed trainings. The same cooperation required is required in a training as in any kind of classroom. So if you're doing a training and you've made the people you're training feel uncomfortable, you have not been successful. And most diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings do not do that. But what Christopher Rufo did is cherry pick probably the worst of best practices and suggest that that represents a whole field. And it's not a CRT field. It's a field probably of diversity and anti-racism training. But that's something separate. But CRT is getting blamed for that. Okay. My name is Daphne Mooring. And um, my question is for Aaron. I have 58 years of, of raised a, as a Christian, continue to, to learn a, to be a better Christian every day. And the thing that keeps troubling me with this Christian organization um, creating the divisiveness is 
I was first taught to love my neighbor, love my neighbor as myself. It didn't matter the color of their skin. When Jesus died, he died to redeem all of our, our souls, right? Not a particular color skin. So will you reconcile how the whole Christian fundamentals uh, meets what you're advocating? And I, you know, I, I, I appreciate that in, in so many ways because uh, it's, it's what I, I love talking uh, the most about, which is uh, God's word and, and its redemptive effect on us. Uh, and uh, God's word, you know, when, when we see, uh, when we read God's word in its entirety in, in the Bible, um, we see this Lord Jesus Christ who came down and told us, you know, greatest command is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and the question is, what does that mean? And we, thankfully, we have, you know, 66 bu books of the Bible and the letters from the epistles to understand that. And I think one thing in particular uh, that I really come back to uh, on this is the idea of, uh, in Christianity, we teach this idea of, of crucifying yourself. I, I died myself and I've been risen again in Jesus Christ. Uh, and that means all of, our, all of our intuitions, everything that we are about us, ourselves, we lay down and we take on this life of Jesus. We take on this Holy Spirit and it changes the way we look at the world. Uh, and that will mean sometimes loving our neighbor means disagreeing with them. If we see them doing something or supporting something, uh, that, according to God's word, is harmful to their eternal soul. Uh, and that also means, as Je the same Jesus who told us to love our neighbor as ourselves tells us uh, that, you know, when we do, you know, he lived perfect, we believe he lived the perfect life and was perfect love, uh, and they crucified him for it. Um, so, you know, oftentimes having people disagree with you, uh, we're told that will come, and the book of James tells us that. And so, uh, it, it is a, it's a tough road, and we always, we talk about a lot at uh, CCV, we want to do so we want to do this advocacy when we take on difficult issues uh, with the utmost grace and love and charity towards those who disagree with us, um, but we also want to do so um, firmly, uh, and, and that's, that's what we attempt to do. Understanding that people, even people, again, Kevin attends a church, uh, and, uh, and he would disagree strongly with a lot of the positions that we believe the, the Bible has led us to. I'm a, I'm, I lead the trustee board at Central Chapel Afro, African American Episcopal Church. The reason why there is an African Methodist Episcopal Church is in the 1700s, as black people began going to white churches, Christians overlaid their racism on top of that. Richard Allen was pulled off his knees at a church in Philadelphia, and he left and said, we will bother you no more. Columbus is the headquarters of the third district of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. That district covers Pennsylvania, Ohio, parts of West Virginia. It was formed in 1833. The de denomination was formed in 1816. We have a black church because the white church did not treat us as equals and as neighbors. And so we need to understand that history. My name is Kwesi Cambone. And I think it's really great that we're having this discussion, but the danger for me is we have to be careful we don't deal in generalities. And Aaron, my question is for you, because you talked about the concern about how critical race theory has been, has been implemented, but I wanna know from you specifics. That is, talk to us about a district, a school, or, or somebody, just give specifics about how it has been implemented, what have you seen, what do you know? Because I think the danger is, without specifics, we, we, we don't add any light to this conversation. No, I, I absolutely, I appreciate that question. Uh, I think there's a few different ones I can give stories, and, and a lot of these things you can find online uh, as well. Uh, you know, you have the sort of the extreme examples uh, in places like San Francisco where they have uh, stopped teaching algebra because they have said algebra, mathematics, perpetuates uh, a systematic of, uh, racism. Uh, you have things here in Columbus uh, at, at one uh, prominent uh, non-public school, actually, uh, where uh, teachers uh, and a handful of students led a walkout uh, of students uh, to protest uh, as a part of a, a Black Lives Matter movement and uh, supporting, you know, opposing systematic racism. Uh, and again, for students who um, might agree uh, that racism is a problem, but don't agree with the mantras and everything else that goes along with that movement, they're feeling pressured and shamed to go along with that. Uh, and that, that, again, that, that you can go through, we can see examples of examples like that uh, happening all over the country, especially uh, over the last few, uh, over the last year. Bishop Hartley. Well, I wish we had more time, but we're going to turn it back over to Niel now for concluding remarks.
Well, I hope you found today's forum insightful and helpful as you continue to have these important conversations in your community. Please make plans to join us next Wednesday as CMC presents Unpacking Ohio's New Biennial Budget. Our thanks to forum sponsors Carnot Health, the Columbus Dispatch, and to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. And thank you to our online virtual seat patrons. And our special appreciation and guests, uh, excuse me, appreciation and thanks to our speakers, Jennifer Adair, Aaron Baer, Kevin Magruder, and our host, Alyssa Windman Neese. Thank you all for joining us. We could not do this without you. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday at the Columbus Metropolitan Club as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Thank you. <laughs>